Hello, this is Professor White, and I'll be discussing about the cell structure and function. So before we start, I just wanted to run down some of the basic information we're going to cover today. The first one is your cell theory and the cell size. Why is the cell really small? Um, also, we're going to look at the difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, as well as the organelles or your parts of the cell. We're going to focus on the different parts that we need to know their functions all the way down to cytoskeleton. So we'll start first with the cell theory. So cell theory is a detailed study that began in the 1800s, and this is actually the unified concept of biology. Now, this ori is originated from the work of biologists Schleiden and Schwann in 1838, 1839, as you can see here. Um, the cell theory basically states that all organisms are composed of cell. So this has been proven from the studies of um, Matthias Schleiden and um, Theodore Schwann of what they found out about plant and animal cells. Now, another theory of the cell theory is all cells comes from pre-existing cell. And this came from the research of Rudolf Virchow on uh, during the 1850s. Now, the third um, cell theory statement says that cells are the smallest structure and function unit of the organism, which, of course, um, it's not mentioned here, but Anton van Leeuwenhoek was the one who were able to see that cells are actually those have compartments and that cells are the smallest structural and functional unit of the organism. Now, all plants and animals are composed of cell. And as you can see here in this diagram, you'd be able to see that the cell is around about mi one micrometer to 10 millimeters big. And to put it into perspective, you can see it over here that the cell is around here in the middle, plant and animal cells, as opposed to atoms, which is, of course, the smallest in size. And to compare, the blue whale is on the far right end. So moving forward, we know that the cell range, as I mentioned earlier, is from one millimeter down to one micrometer. So that's basically the range of the size of the cell. And the cells need to have a large surface area of plasma membrane to adequately exchange materials. Now, the surface area to volume ratio requires that cells be small. Now, the reason behind this is that um, if the cells are large, then the surface area relative to the volume decreases as the cell becomes larger. <coughs> what it means is um, the volume um, is living cytoplasm. So that's space right there. It has to sit different organelles, which demands nutrients and waste product, uh, produces wastes. All right. So the cells specialize in absorption or utilize uh, membrane modifications such as microvilli or great, um, so that it'll greatly increase the surface um, area per unit volume. So there's a lot of things going on inside. So in short, the cell is actually uh, packed a compact space, but at the same time, able to have that um, surface area that can fit all those different organelles. Now to get a visual, um, the surface area to volume ratio gets smaller as the cell gets larger. Thus, if the cell grows beyond the certain limit, not enough material will be able to cross the cell membrane fast enough to accommodate the increased cellular volume. When this happens, the cells must divide into smaller cells with favorable surface area to volume ratio or cease to function. So that's why cells are small. So we want to get to our next part, which is your prokaryotic cells. So prokaryotic cells lack a membrane bound nucleus. So it means that it doesn't have a boundary on the nucleus, although there is a nucleus, of course. And the structure, uh, it's really small and it's a simpler type of cell compared to eukaryotic cell, which have a nucleus. Now, prokaryotic cells um, are placed in two taxonomic domains. One is a bacteria and another is your archaea. So these are the two types of cells, um, types of uh, domains that are prokaryotic cells. Now, normally uh, to characterize them, we already know bacteria, but archaea, they usually live in very extreme um, habitats. Now, these domains are structurally similar, but biochemically different. 
Now let's go to eukaryotic cells. Now eukaryotic cells, the domain eukarya includes, of course, uh, protists. You have your fungi, your plants, and animals. So that's basically our uh, domain that are prokaryotic cells. Now the cell contains a membrane-bound nucleus that houses the DNA. So the nucleus basically has a nuclear membrane and specialized organelles. So they're more advanced than prokaryotic cells. And also plasma membrane, which is like your um, boundary of your protein uh, of your cell, eukaryotic cell, and they are much larger than prokaryotic cells. Now some cells, such as plant cells, have cell wall. So in this diagram, you can see how the original prokaryotic cell kind of like evolved to become a eukaryotic cell over time. So you can see over here, original prokaryotic cell at the top right here, and then the cell gains nucleus by the plasma membrane, and then so on. Uh, when the cell starts to become a little bit more complex, then they have more complex structure. Now, eukaryotic cells are compartmentalized, meaning they contain small structures called organelles. Now, they perform a specific function and isolates reactions from others. So it means they can independently work um, to perform a certain function. Now, there's, there are two classes of organelles. One is an endomembrane system, uh, which contains your organelles that communicate with each other um, via membrane channels or small vesicles. Um, some are energy-related organelles, so they are your mitochondria and chloroplasts, and normally they're basically independent and self-sufficient, so they are organelles that has to do with um, energy using or energy generating uh, processes. Now let's take a look at the anatomy of the cell. As you can see over here, there are several parts of your cell in its anatomy. You have your plasma membrane, cyto cytoskeleton, you got your microtubules, you have your intermediate filaments, centrioles, centrosome. I'm just going to read the par parts and then I'll discuss the most essential ones. Um, lysosome, vesicles, cytoplasm, nucleus, nuclear envelope, ribosome, you have your endoplasmic reticulums, both rough and uh, smooth ERs, peroxisome, you have your polyribosome, mitochondrion, and your Golgi apparatus. For the cells uh, in plants, you should have about the same. Some of them are found specifically for plant cells, such as your central vacuole, the cell wall. These are very specific to plants. Um, your Chloroplasts is specific to plants. Your gran uh, granium, you have your lamella. These are some of the uh, unique um, parts of your plant cell. Now let's talk about the nucleus. So nucleus is the command center of the cell and usually it's near the center. And this is separated from the cytoplasm, um, other organelles by a nuclear envelope. So it consists of a layer of membrane and nuclear pores permit the exchange between nucleoplasm and cytoplasm. So that's uh, the nuclear pores actually is a thoroughfare of information, which contains your chromatin, which is a semi-fluid nucleoplasm. Chromatin is actually um, containing the DNA of genes and proteins. And normally it condenses to form chromosomes and those chromosomes are formed during cell position. And the dark nucleolose is composed of ribosomal RNA. This is usually um, the one producing the subunits of your ribosome. So this is an example of how your um, nucleus looks like. So you have your nuclear pore, you have your nuclear envelope, and then you can see that pore up close right there. You have your chromatin, nucleoplasm. Okay, so that's your nucleus. Now the ribosome is another important organelle that you need to know about. This is the site of protein synthesis in the cell. It's composed of our RNA, our ribosomal RNA, which consists a large subunit and a small subunit. Um, subunits are made um, in the nucleus and it may be located on the endoplasmic reticulum, thereby making it rough because there are ribosomes in there or they're just free roaming in the cytoplasm, either singly or in group. They are called polyribosomes. So this is how a ribosome looks like. As you can see, those strands right there are basically those polypeptides that ribosomes made based on the instruction of your nucleus as the nucleus sends out the message from the DNA of a specific segment that needs to be um, produced or synthesized to make protein. Endomembrane system. So these are series of intracellular membranes that compartmentalize the cell. 
So normally what it does, it restricts reactions to specific compartments within the cell. So it consists of your nuclear envelope. So they are kind of like a boundary. Uh, membranes of endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus and vesicles, all they have, they all have the endomembrane system, which is the membranes. They're boundaries. They have their own kind of like a, a wall. Not really a wall, but it's basically just their boundaries so you can see their shape. One endomembrane system is your endoplasmic reticulum. So endoplasmic reticulum, these are a system of membrane channels and saccules or flattened vesicles continuous with the outer membrane of the nuclear envelope. There are two types of um, endoplasmic reticulum. You have your rough ER, which are studded with ribosomes on the cytoplasmic side, and they synthesize proteins and modifies and process these proteins, either add sugar to the protein or um, results in glycoprotein. So that's your rough ER. Smooth ER, then there's no ribosomes here, but it synthesizes lipids. Now, this is usually the site of detoxification or storage, and usually they form transport of vesicles. The transport vesicles are usually the ones that uh, brings in wastes or anything that needs to be transported out of the cell. So this is how your endoplasmic reticulum looks like. So the ones that studied, that's your um, rough endoplasmic reticulum with those ribosome studs and your smooth endoplasmic reticulum right there. Golgi apparatus. So Golgi apparatus is another, is another part of the cell, which consists of 3 to 20 flattened curved saccules and it resembles a stack of hollow pancakes. And uh, normally what it does, it modifies the proteins and lipids. And um, so it receives uh, vesicles from the endoplasmic reticulum, kind of like the interface or what we call a cyst, and packages them in vesicles. So once they prepare it for shipment because they have uh, modified the protein, then it packages, uh, packages those proteins in vesicles from the trans or outer face ready to go with either it's delivered within the cell or export from the cell, meaning it, it will, it's released out of the cell through secretion or exocytosis. So this is how your transport of those um, modified proteins or lipids, and this is your Golgi apparatus right here. And as soon as the protein is modified, then they can either be transported somewhere in the cell or outside. Lysosomes. So the next part is your lysosome. These are your membrane-bound vesicles. This is not found in plants, which is produced by the Golgi apparatus. Now the Golgi apparatus, now this usually contains a very powerful digestive enzymes and are highly acidic. Now, normally there's a digestion of large molecules. So your lysosome is involved in that or recycling of cellular resources. Sometimes um, the program cell death, as we call it, is because of that lysosome. It's kind of like a suicidal bag, as we call it. Now, some genetic diseases can cause the defect of your lysosomal enzyme, and um, it causes one of the genetic diseases, lysosomal storage disease, or you call that Tay-Sachs disease, because it fails to, to kind of like digest and recycle or even perform apoptosis. Uh, because it's deficient or it's a genetic defect. So this is your lysosome right here in the cell. And basically that's your lysosome. Now, just to summarize our lesson for today, proteins produced in the ER or in rough endoplasmic reticulum to be specific and lipids from smooth ER. They are carried in vesicles to the Golgi apparatus. Now the Golgi apparatus modifies these products and then sorts and packages them into vesicles that go to various cell destinations, whether within the cell or outside. So normally in um, when I was teaching this in lower grade levels, like high school and middle school, we call the Golgi apparatus like a FedEx because they're the ones packaging and shipping those proteins and lipids. Now the secretory vesicles carry products to the membrane where exocytosis produces secretions. And last but not the least, lysosomes fuse with incoming vesicles and digest macromolecules or large molecules. So just a visual summary of your endomembrane system. So the nearest to the nucleus right here is basically your rough endoplasmic reticulum studded with ribosomes. And as you can see here, just around the corner is your smooth endoplasmic reticulum. 
So the difference is that rough endoplasmic synthesizes protein, smooth endoplasmic synthesizes lipids and performs various other functions. Your Golgi apparatus is uh, the ones modifying your lipids and proteins and they package it, sorts them into the vesicles so that the vesicles can uh, transport these proteins within the cell or outside. Now the lysosome is the one that contains digestive enzymes that breaks down worn out cell parts or any substances entering the cell at the plasma membrane and the secretory vesicles are the ones that normally carries anything, proteins and stuff, and they're the one who leads the cell if they need to send those um, substances or proteins out. Now, peroxisomes are similar to lysosomes and your lysosomes, we already know that they also have these vesicles and same with uh, lysosomes. However, the enzymes synthesized by free ribosomes in cytoplasm instead of the endoplasmic reticulum. So the ribosomes roaming around the cytoplasm, they're the ones that makes your peroxisomes. So the enzymes in the peroxisomes are synthesized by the free ribosomes. They are active in lipid metabolism and they catalyze reactions that produce hydrogen peroxide. So basically they're toxic and they usually break down water and oxygen by catalase is like an enzyme. So that's basically it. So peroxisomes are normally for lipid metabolism and catalyzing reaction by catalase or enzyme. So this is your peroxisome. Vacuoles. Now, normally vacuoles are found in plants and it's a membranous sac that are larger than vesicles. They store materials that occur in excess. Others very specialized contractile Vacuole. Now, plant cells typically have a central vacuole, which is up to 90% volume of some cells. Why? Because it functions as a storage of water, nutrients, pigments, and waste products. And then the development of turgor pressure, so kind of like um, a big blob of water inside the cell. Now, some functions performed by lysosomes in other eukaryotes um, is similar to vacuoles. So this is your vacuole. As you can see, it occupies a big chunk of space in your plant cell. Chloroplast structure. Again, this is found in your plant cell and it's bounded by a double membrane. Now the inner membrane enfolded, it forms like a disc-like thylakoids, which are stacked to form grana. Now it's suspended in a semi-fluid stroma. Now it is green due to chlorophyll, which is a green photosynthetic pigment. This is found only in the inner membranes of the chloroplast, which is your chlorophyll inside of chloroplast. The next one is what your chloroplast is actually um, capable of doing. So the membranous organelles or that serve as a site of photosynthesis is your chloroplast. Now it captures the light energy to drive cellular machinery. So you call this your photosynthesis. It synthesizes the carbohydrates from carbon dioxide and water. And, it, and that makes um, plants capable of making their own food using carbon dioxide as the only carbon source. Now energy poor compounds converted to energy rich compounds. So together with the solar energy, carbon dioxide and water, it produces, your plants produces carbohydrate or sugar plus oxygen. Now only plants, algae, and certain bacteria are capable of conducting photosynthesis. To continue on with the chloroplast, chloroplast is bound by a double membrane organized into flattened discs like sacs called thylakoid. Now chlorophyll and other pigments capture solar energy, so that's the, the use of it. And the enzymes synthesize carbohydrates. So here's how it looks like on the inside of your chloroplast. So this is your thylakoid, your grana, and mitochondria. So mitochondria, these are smaller than chloroplast. It contains ribosomes in their own DNA. Now it is surrounded by a double membrane. Now the inner membrane surrounds the matrix and it's convoluted or there are folds to form cristae. Now the matrix or the inner semi-fluid containing respiratory enzymes, they usually break down carbohydrates. Now this is involved in cellular respiration and produce most of the ATP utilized by the cell. ATP is your energy in short, kind of like a battery. So this is your mitochondria. When you split open, you will see the outer membrane, the inner membrane, your cristae, and your matrix. Cytoskeleton. So the cytoskeleton uh, maintains the cell shape. Now it assists in the movement of cells and organelles. And there are three types of macromolecular fibers. You have your actin filaments, your intermediate filaments, and your microtubules. Now you can assemble and disassemble this as needed. Actin filaments are extremely thin filaments like twisted pearl and necklace. Now it's a dense web just under plasma membrane, which maintains the cell shape. It is a support for microvilli in intestinal cells and intracellular traffic control. So for moving stuff around within the cell um, and cytoplasm. 
plasmic streaming. Now, the function in pseudopods uh, of amoeboid cells, so it's kind of like a um, mobile or motility function. Pinch mother cell into two after animal mitosis. So during animal mitosis, it causes the splitting of your cell. And it is an impo important component in your muscle contraction in other mice. But this is how your uh, active filament up operation looks like. Intermediate filaments, this is basically in between the size of actin filaments and microtubules. They are like rope assembly of fibrous polypeptides and so protein in short. So they vary in nature from tissue to tissue from time to time. It supports the nuclear envelope and cell to cell junction, just like um, holding skin tightly together. So that's your intermediate filaments. And your microtubules, you have a microtubules as a hollow cylinder is made of two globular proteins, alpha and beta tubulins. And um, a spontaneous pairing of alpha and beta forms what you call dimers. Now dimers are arranged, uh, arranged themselves into tubular spirals of 13 dimers around. So the assembly um, is under control of microtubule organizing center. And um, the most important um, micro microtubule is your centrosome. This normally interacts with protein kinesin and dynein to cause the movement of organelles. So this is basically important because of the movements of the organelles. This is how your microtubule operation looks like, right? So these are examples of exoskeletons of organisms. So the exoskeleton of your plants and then the letter B is your intermediate filaments found in peacocks, like their fibrous um, parts of it. And then your uh, microtubules, which is found in this chameleon right here. They have a tubulin dimer in their skin. Centrioles, these are short hollow cylinders composed of 27 microtubules and microtubules arranged into nine overlapping triplets. Now, uh, one pair, uh, for animal cell is found in each cell located in the centrosome and um, it's oriented at the right angles to each other. They usually separate during mitosis, so that's the uh, use of your central, to so determine the plane of division or where the division is happening when the cells divide. And this may give rise to what we call the basal bodies of cilia and flagella. So this is your centrioles. They're kind of like the ones that gives where the cell is divided in half later on during mitosis. Cilia and flagella, these are your hair-like projections from cell surface that aid in the cell movement. Basically, that's all cilia and flagella usually um, have. It's very different from prokaryote flagella because of the covering of the plasma membrane. Um, it, for you to remember, in eukaryotes, cilia are much shorter than flagella. Cilia moves in coordinate waves like oars. Flagella moves like a propeller or corkscrew. So that's the difference between the two. So this is your structure of your flagellum. And basically that's about it. So I'd like you to just read on your own on the differences between your prokaryotic cells and um, eukaryotic cells in terms of the diameter and size and what is present in your animal and plant cells. So obviously cell wall, there's nothing for animals and yes to plants. Um, there is no lysosomes in plants. Okay, and there's no chloroplasts in animals. Okay, and there's no centrioles in plant cell. Okay, so that's basically it. So just to recap what I discussed, we talked about the cell theory, why the cell is so small, the difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cell. We also have your nucleus and ribosomes, the endomembrane system. We talked about the vesicles and vacuoles, the energy related organelles and your cytoskeleton. With that said, thank you for listening and I hope you learned something. Again, this is Professor White and I will see you in class. Bye.